The title of my lecture is How Feminism is Undermining Processes of Social Reproduction. It's a lecture which I gave at the Institute for Women's Health at UCL in May 2017. There were three main aims to the lecture. One was to provide an alternative paradigm to the mainstream feminist paradigm. Secondly, I want to show how relations of social reproduction are being undermined. Thirdly, show how processes of natural selection can be useful for understanding human sexual behaviour. When I say that I want to provide an alternative paradigm to the mainstream feminist paradigm, the, the main aspect which I'm thinking about is the feminist assumption that sex differences are entirely socially constructed. This goes all the way back to Simone de Beauvoir, who argued that one is bo not born but becomes a woman. Um, some Epstein said gender distinctions as dichotomous categories are perpetrated and maintained by social mechanisms and are socially constructed. This is, this is the, the feminist paradigm and I want to argue that gender differences are actually real and they're something which have evolved through um, the eons of our existence. And um, when I say that I want to show how social reproduction is being undermined, by social reproduction, I'm talking about the social processes um, which lead to the physiological process of reproduction. So that's, for example, mate selection, courting, mating and marriage, the family, resource provisioning, childcare. These are all the processes which facilitate the reproduction of the human species. And I want to show how these processes are being undermined by feminism. And thirdly, I want to show how processes of natural selection can actually be useful for understanding human sexual behaviour. We'll now move on to the lecture which I gave. Thank you. Being artistic or doing cave paintings or whatever. And she might possibly have one child and perhaps not look after that child that well because she's not great at childcare. So her patterns don't get reproduced into future generations. And then maybe the second offspring is more keen on mating, more keen on childcare, but she doesn't pay too much attention to who she mates with. And she ends up with a couple of kids, but they don't have too many resources, so they don't reproduce very well. So her patterns don't get um, transferred into future generations. And then your third, your third uh, offspring perhaps is, is keen on mating and keen on childcare and very good at selecting a mate who's going to provide a lot of resources. And so these her, her patterns, her behavioural genetic patterns will get transferred into the future. So that's the, the basic idea underlying these processes of natural selection. And um, so if we get back to what are the differences which make a difference, and that is this the basic fact that for a female to reproduce, she, she after nine months of pregnancy, followed by breastfeeding, um, she produces one offspring. And during the time that a female can produce one child, a male, depending on his levels of energy, could theoretically produce 280 or more. So this is actually a, a very, this, this basic difference, which we seem to be completely in denial of in contemporary society, has really big ramifications for behavior because it means what does it mean? First of all, it means that the males who are most promiscuous are the ones who are going to most successfully reproduce. So male promiscuity and liking of sex is likely to be transferred into future generations. And we are the offspring of, or the, the males are, you know, our, our ancestral grandfathers were the ones who, who, who liked sex a lot. And for females, our ancestral grandmothers would have been the women who were very good at childcare, the ones who didn't look after their children and, and were just interested in sex. Probably their offspring wouldn't have survived very far. Another feature is that the, that the sex which invests the most in parenting, and in humans this is the female, is also going to be the sex which is most selective about their mate. Um, and and this, is, this is something else which we'll also see. And um, we'll also find that um, 
females, because they're selective about their mate, because they need to find one who's going to be supportive of their parenting processes, they're more likely to be averse to casual sex. And if you look, all of, all of these patterns can be seen in, in, there's been ample research which has shown all of this. Um, I'm, I'll just, uh, so if we just look at males and promiscuity, there's a, there's a nice story about, this is uh, President Coolidge and his wife, and apparently they were visiting a chicken farm one day. And um, his wife noticed the cockerel mating with lots of hens, and she said to the farmer, how many times, you know, how many times does the cockerel mate in one day? And the farmer told her, I, I don't know how many times, let's say 25. And she said, please, could you go and tell that to the president that this cockerel is so active? So the farmer told the president, and the president said, uh, how many times, <laughs> how many different chickens does, does the cockerel mate with one chicken or with many different chickens? And the farmer said, the cockerel mates with very many different chickens, so please go and tell that to my wife. And this is, this is a, a, another very basic difference between um, males and females in mammals. So, for example, if you have a, a male a bull and it's presented with one cow, it will mate with that cow and then stop. If it's pre presented with lots of new cows, it will carry on mating with them. Um, so, and that is also found in the male, male human being. There's, there's, been, there's huge amounts of research. I, I'm not sure what these, these um, male anthropologists um, are trying to prove, but you've got sample sizes of like 200,000 individuals from 53 different countries, which show that men have a higher sex drive regardless of age, um, that they are much more likely to be seeking short-term mates, they're more, they wanted more sexual partners than women and differences in consumption of pornography and masturbation. And it should be pointed out that these differences actually increase in countries with higher levels of gender equality. So the feminist argument would be that these patterns are simply cultural constructions. Well, they're not, because when you've got cultural similarity, uh, gender equality, um, the differences between men and women actually increase. And similarly, there, there's ample data which shows that um, females are much more likely to look after their children, and, and they look at this in many different ways. And in fact, when you go to some of the most um, egalitarian um, tribal societies, which such as the, these are hunter-gatherer hunter societies in Africa, where um, they're sort of seen as the ideal in having gender similarity, you will still find that females look after the children for very many more hours than the males do. Um, the probably the closest um, difference, the, the, the lowest level of difference is in a country like the US, where the differences between the number of hours that fathers and mothers look after their children decreases. But nonetheless, it's a universal that mothers look after the children more than fathers. And obviously, of course, you get exceptions, but I'm talking about patterns. Um, now, the other thing is that um, because females are the more investing sex, they are more selective. Um, this is hedged about, it's, co it's complicated, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying, but they will, um, they're much more selective about their partners. So generally speaking, they will look for partners who are more committed, um, who are more athletic and who have got more resources and status. Um, women in their kin um, prefer successful men as marriage partners because they know these men will provide resources for the women which will help to keep their children healthy. So this is, and this comes out in um, this pattern of hypergamy where women in, tend to marry men with more status and resources. Um, than they have. And it's quite interesting because if you look at this, these female processes of selection for mates who've got status and resources is actually the force which produces the system called patriarchy, which feminists rail against. If feminists really wanted to get rid of patriarchy, they should start choosing men who didn't have status and resources. Um, but then their children probably wouldn't survive as well. But there's also lots of evidence to show that this is how women do choose their mates. So you've got um, largest marriage studies on women's and men's preferences, included more than 10,000 people, 
37 cultures found that good financial prospects, um, women rated good financial prospects higher than men did in all cultures, um, three, yeah, three fifths or, or five, three fourths or five sixths rated good financial prospects as more important than men did. Um, and this is, and also for example, when um, a man's employment status declines, his job prospects declines, divorce is more likely, whereas women married to wealthy men are much less likely to get divorced. And um, all of this, this process results in, in, in these high levels of competition um, between men, because women don't just go for someone who can provide the adequate resources, they're looking for the best in their particular um, mate pool. And you've got, if you look, there are, there are sort of genetic studies which look back at the course of where we all came from. And apparently, um, women, it's estimated that about 40% of males reproduced and 80% of females reproduced. So that means there would have been very intense competition going on uh, among men in order to reproduce. So the, these are the things which will have produced this patriarchal structure with, with men competing. So um, we also find, because females are selective about who they mate with, that there is a, a female aversion to casual sex. And this hasn't been studied so much. I mean, we can see in the previous data that they're less, they, they, they are not as promiscuous as men, but they're there is actually evidence to suggest that women really do have some find casual sex psychologically quite difficult. It's associated with greater emotional problems. They report less enjoyment, more guilt, more shame, more regret, and more disappointment. Um, so that's all. Now, the, 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 the question which, in a way, you can't predict, and let me just, um, oh, yes, here, we, here, here I, I've got some graphs which show um, they'll be available on your website. Now, the, mist the, the, the real mystery is why, in human beings, we do have high levels of um, paternal investment. Now, in other species, for example, seahorses, the baby seahorses sea could not survive without the paternal investment. But um, and among mammals, there's very, very little paternal investment. But among humans, the fathers do invest in their children. And this, because this is not essential, and because children can survive without fathers investing, and because fathers could theoretically re reproduce and mate with lots of people, this, this is a puzzle which evolutionists um, do uh, concern themselves with. And there are various factors which, this, this is just a little rhyme, I quite like it, but anyway. Um, there are various factors which, um, affect uh, paternal investment. One is a physical environment, so quite simply, if you've got uh, very hospitable conditions, then mothers and babies, the, the, the babies are more likely to survive without paternal investment. If you've got very hostile conditions um, with a lack of resources, then uh, the father needs to hang around to make sure that his offspring survives. So that would be one mechanism. Another mechanism would be operational sex ratio. So, for example, if there's loads of females available, then the father would be less likely to stick around because there are so many other reproductive opportunities that the opportunity cost of staying um, with, with one mate would be too high. Um, and then there's a social environment. So in some societies, you've got um, polygamy, and in others, you've got monogamy. And this will also channel men's behavior. Polygamy is more likely to result where there are um, plenty of resources. So the man can gather together the resources to support a number of wives. Polygamy in the long term doesn't work out as well as monogamy because um, a number of men don't get mates. The wives of a polygamous men tend to be less fertile than women um, who are mono monogamously um, partners. And also, you find that the children of a polygamous couple have less resources among them, so they themselves are less likely to have children. So in the long run, um, monogamy sort of tends to win out over polygamy. So that's another um, set of forces influencing, um, influencing uh, behavior. So um, how did this monogamy come about? Well, um, one of the things which is um, 
seen as being help, helping to facilitate monogamy is the fact that um, human females compared to, say, primates, um, we don't have estrus. Estrus means that when you're fertile, you show the world and then the males compete to mate with you and then they wander off again. We've, um, we hide our fertility and that way, if, if um, a male wants to make sure that he um, reproduces, he has to stay with his mate to be sure he gets her on her fertile period. Females are also continuously sexually receptive, which you don't find among animal species. And it's also thought that orgasm facilitates this. So if females actually enjoy sex, they're likely to make um, to engage in more pair bonding activities. And these are really important in keeping men on board. And you do find, so for example, um, it is actually the quality of the marital relationship which will determine um, the father's relationship with the child. When fathers um, are separated from their wives, they often lose, they, they tend to see their child a lot less. So custodial, the non, if, if the non-custodial parent is a mother, she will see her child more frequently than where the non-custodial parent um, is, is the father. So the idea is that what looks like parenting effort by men is very often, we're talking about sort of underlying forces, is actually more mating effort. And if you take away that mating possibility, the parenting possibility tends to go down. What looks like mating effort on the part of females is actually parenting effort and an attempt to keep the male on board to invest. So um, there's biological factors and there, there's also mate guarding. And that's where the male sticks around just to make sure that his offspring um, stays alive. Um, and I like this. Now, the titi monkey is really interesting because um, this is one primate where the father does most of the childcare. And what's remarkable about the titi monkey is that the, the male and female are constantly together. They mate, you know, they mate for life. And why is it that the, in the Titi monkey we've actually got the father doing the child's care? And I think it's quite interesting because he has got his mate with him all the time. So she can't go off and reproduce elsewhere. And I suspect the reason why species, why males of the species are less likely to do child care is because if they did child care, they would be at the risk of losing their reproductive resource. Um, so that's, that's whereas, whereas um, if, the, if the female does childcare, even if the male goes and mates somewhere else, she doesn't lose him for good. Whereas if the female becomes pregnant, then she, he, the male has really lost his reproductive resource. So um, mate guarding. Yeah, and the final one, which I think is, um, th this is seen because people who research these things still think none of these mechanisms are quite enough to explain why the male hangs around. And a crucial mechanism is female withholding of sex. So um, because sex is more highly valued by men and their access depends on women's willingness to supply it, it can be seen as a valued good where women act as sellers and men act as buyers. And by withholding sex, women increase its value. They render it a scarce resource. Scarcity ratchets up the price that men are willing to pay for it. Um, and this means that pressure is put by women on other women not to undercut them. Because if other women give sex away too cheaply, it reduces what women can ask for men. So. In this way, if monog monogamy is socially encouraged and enforced, it encourages a man to stay with a woman because he's less likely to have opportunities to reproduce elsewhere. So basically, if a, if a woman only, if you, you will only get sex if you hang around and commit to that woman. And because all women are behaving like that, you're not going to have many opportunities for mating outside your mate. So this is... It's female sexual withholding, which is seen to be key to um, paternal investment. And um, 
there's this this paternal investment has become the the the, the the idea is that this has become um, embedded because paternal investment um, facilitates reproductive success. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that keeping the father around is, is, is a, a, a successful strategy. So, for example, if you look at historical evidence, where you had, um, say, historic, you had population crashes through plague or whatever, it would be the offspring of the um, of, of the of the children who had fathers who um, were ha perhaps economically successful who would be more likely to survive. Also, where mothers worked, um, their children would have a higher mortality rate because they would be less likely to be breastfed. Um, and you also find that the job that a father did had a significant impact on the child's mortality. And then there's plenty of evidence also from developing countries which shows that, um, where, that a link between the presence of the father and um, health and reproductive success of the child, or maybe I should, where the father dies, um, there would be evidence of higher mortality rates and, and evidence where if, if the father um, invests in the child, this enhances also the child's ability to acquire um, social and culturally important resources. So having a, a father around who has resources facilitates um, the, the child's own reproductive success. And then there's a lot of evidence from contemporary society. The, the, the evidence from contemporary society isn't as clear in terms of mortality because we've got l much lower levels of infant mortality anyway. So you, you can't really make links between presence of the father and infant mortality. But you can find that where the father is present. Um, for example, children are likely to do, I think the child, the, the, uh, the, the father has four times um, the impact on the educational outcomes of the child than the mother does, for example. And good educational outcomes delay um, reproduction, which means that um, when you when you do re reproduce, you have yourself more status and resources and therefore can in turn invest more in your child. So um, there, there is, there's a lot of evidence from contemporary society to suggest that the presence of the father does have a positive impact. And uh, there's a lot of links between marital status and, uh, and, the, and the child, child mortality. Um, so to, to sum up, um, you have, to sum up at this point, you have processes of female selection which encourage monogamy and monogamy encourages paternal investment. Now, it's possible that paternal investment doesn't just in, improve reproductive fitness of the offspring, but the, the paternal investment is actually um, central to what makes us human. And this is that there's two different um, arguments here. So before we're, we're Homo sapiens, and once upon a time there were lots of there were lots of different Homos. There were Neanderthals and various different ones, and it was Homo sapiens who won out. And the theory is that the reason Homo sapiens, human beings, us, the reason we were successful was because we delayed mating, and this gave us more time to acquire language and cultural resources and made us a whole more, a lot more competitive um, than the, the people around us. So it's this extended period of childhood which is facilitated by paternal investment which has made human beings actually human. And uh, there is another um, dimension to this which is uh, apparently the human female actually um, gives birth that we give birth to the child, um, the baby, earlier. A human baby is more premature than a chimpanzee baby. And this means that um, we are able, because this allows, it's something, it's the size of the head. This means that our heads can grow bigger um, than they would if we gave birth later, because if we gave birth later, 
um, we would have to have a smaller head because otherwise it would kill us because we're upright and this affects the size of the baby that we can have. It's kind of complicated. But um, because paternal investment enables mothers to give birth to babies earlier whose brains can develop to be larger. So at this end, paternal investment is also very important in, need, in, in helping humans to be human. So, um, creation of Adam. Now, where's the problem? Um, so feminism, feminism doesn't look at all these different um, processes of natural selection. Um, it, it has this, it, it, it's got a, a sort of different um, set of ideologies. And, um, and what I'm going to show is that these are actually um, undermining many of the processes which facilitate um, social reproduction. Um, firstly, it undermines the uh, process of resource provision and I'll, I'll sort of go into more detail, and it reduces pair bonding opportunities and it undermines paternal investment in family life. Um, now, processes of resource provision. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to set up, um, the, the, the idea is that, that women, and we're, we're trying to make sure this is the case, that women compete equally with men for resources. What happens is that as the biggest sort of gender inequality occurs at the higher levels of um, society. So there's very, there's very little gender inequality amongst lower social economic groups. When I say gender equality, I'm talking about payment in work. So people in high status jobs, there's a lot of gender inequality in pay. People in low status jobs, there's almost no um, gender inequality in pay. And as women compete, um, at the top of the status hierarchy, um, there tends to be a downward pressure on males. And we can see this in contemporary society where there are very significant increases in levels of part-time employment among men. And part-time employment among men is paid worse than part-time employment among women. There's also this thing called the gig economy, which we see around us all the time, the, the Uber drivers and delivery drivers and all these people where they have very few employment rights. Um, and there, there are also um, increasing you know, un unemployment and all, all these issues. And the reason that this is a problem is because women have a tendency to marry upwards. And at the lower levels of society, there are men without resources. So women choose to have children on their own. So the resource provision is effectively undermined for these women because they don't have mates available to provide for them. So they opt instead to be dependent on the state. And the state is funded by, I think it's taxed by 71% of, or 71% of taxes are, are funded by men. And I think there are interesting things to look at in terms of how we separate. So with males, the productive effort, work, is very much linked to the reproductive opportunities which work presents for males. Production and reproduction are linked for men. And where, if we remove opportunities for reproduction, which is what happens if, if, they, if, if they, there isn't anyone to sort of um, stay with, um, we're also likely to undermine productive um, opportunities. And this, this was predicted as early as the 70s. You're much more likely to see a lot of male marginalization um, and kind of um, quite negative behaviors. So, so this is actually happening. I mean, we, we've got you know, increasing prison populations and, and that sort of thing. And so although our tax base does actually depend on male um, input, um, if we sever this link between production and reproduction too strongly, we could undermine this resource base. Um, now, another thing which happens, we have, as, as women enter these 
compete with men at the higher levels, there are fewer men for them to marry up to because there is this tendency for women to look for someone more educated than themselves. So there is an increasing problem with high status women finding partners. And, uh, and this, I mean, I haven't got research evidence on this, but um, you see, they, they, because higher status women are not interested in marrying lower status men. I suppose it's horrible to say, but I guess if someone is more intelligent or better qualified, I feel less that I have to be wooed by them. Um, she's mainly attracted to Oxbridge graduates. I do prefer dating people who are intellectually superior. Um, it's a curiosity thing, the idea that my partner will be able to teach me things. Um, so, and for educated women who refuse to date non-educated men, it creates two problems. It creates a statistical challenge because they're voluntary, voluntarily limiting themselves to a dating pool that has four women for every three men. But it also gives way too much leverage to those college-educated men. Um, so this is just to, to bear in mind that the statistic I haven't mentioned, which is that um, there are 35% fewer males at university than females. So that's when they say that there are um, three men to every four women. It's because um, there is, there's a substantially smaller chunk of men going to university. So you've got um, pair bonding opportunities being limited at the higher end of um, the sort of dating markets because there are simply fewer men there. And at the lower end, the mass of men are actually not earning more than the mass of women, and women have a tendency to want to marry someone who's in a slightly better position than themselves, so they go it alone. So there you've also got pair bonding being undermined. Um, and then there are various other forces which kind of would work against males committing. Um, I think there's are, oh, and the other thing which is important here, and this is again, you would predict it on the basis of um, of, 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 of casual sex. So um, I got some. This is a book called the Naughty the Naughty's Girls Guide to Feminism. So feminism really, this whole thing where which I talked about earlier, where females withhold sex and they discourage other women from giving sex away too cheaply because this is how they have power over women. Um, feminism is very determined to get rid of all of this. Um, and uh, and I, I, I got these quotes, and, 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 you, and, and it's very determined also that we shouldn't be judging anybody who, who does have more sex than someone else. So um, this is, I mean, this is, um, for many Western women, such encounters, having sex with a stranger you never see again, are so commonplace, it's hard to imagine what shock the concept might have held for people. In fact, the rise of binge drinking goes beyond the zipless fuck. Um, not, only, no, not only do other people um, not know you had your anonymous fuck, but you might not necessarily know it yourself. I mean, this kind of attitude towards sexual behaviour is just something that's probably got not, you know, it's quite unusual. Um, in, in a sort of wider historical context. It's, it's not completely unknown, but um, and there should not be a feminist position on how many people is the right number of people to have slept with. Um, one of the things which you should be committed to doing as a staunch feminist is to stop calling other women sluts. So basically, feminism is encouraging, it, it is, uh, has the effect of encouraging us to give away sex um, at a very very low price, and uh, this is again this is um, this article in the Guardian, and it and it's just that the outcome is so predictable on the basis of looking at evolutionary theory. You you can predict it. So um, this is he thinks that one of the drivers of the so-called hookup culture is the number of men who have found a wealth of avail available women to choose from. I'm not trying to be the morality police, he says. And he's not saying that everyone wants to be or should be seeking marriage or that there aren't women who enjoy casual sex as much as men. But I do think the imbalance gives men much more incentive to play the field. So basically, um, we're creating an environment where we're undermining um, pair bonding opportunities for ourselves. Or so feminism is creating an environment which um, undermines pair bonding opportunities. And finally, um, it does 
had the effects of um, reducing paternal investment. So at the higher end, you've got women who are prepared to have difficulty finding a mate and just decide, well, they'll have a child anyway. And at the lower end, we've got a lot of single parenting, so they don't have paternal investment. I think you could also anticipate that um, you will find potentially higher levels of divorce because there is still available um, a pool of younger women who are having difficulties finding mates. So even if people do get married, there is a, a pool of available women, which I think could mean that the processes of monogamy could be undermined because it is still a, a male who remarries does reproductively better than a man who stays monogamously married all his life. So men who remarry will have more children. They tend to remarry someone younger and they will have more children than someone who doesn't remarry. So um, we are undermining processes of a paternal um, investment. And what do I think, I mean, um, in terms of the future, that, that's, I mean, that, there's a lot of scope for discussion there. But there is one thing which I think is interesting, which isn't discussed at all in evolutionary theory, and I think is very important, and that is paternal attachment. And I think that this could have a very important role in the future. You see, what we see in contemporary society is actually that when men are divorced and are separated from their children, um, they very often suffer from very severe depression. Um, there are suggestions that the high rates of male suicide are actually linked to this. And this wouldn't be predicted by evolutionary theory. And I think that but what has basically happened is that over these eons that we've been evolving, it's the males who are very attached to their children who um, are the ones investing in them. So it's not just these social mechanisms I've been talking about. It's p paternal attachment that has kept monogamy going and kept paternal investment going. And I think that um, this could be a very useful mechanism in the future and it is something that, that we should encourage, which is the fact that, that males do have a very strong attachment to their children and we should make sure that we facilitate and encourage this paternal attachment at all levels.